Um, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, everybody, for letting this be your special Valentine's today. Um, our friends in EMEA are, are giving their significant other a, 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 like a, a finger, like, wait. And they're going to be doing that for the next hour <laughs> over a romantic dinner. Um, no, please don't do that. Hopefully. Yes. We're, we're recording this. So if you're doing that to your significant other, please walk away and then come back and watch the recording later. Please. Yeah, I have to, I have to agree with that. Um, everybody, we're very happy to, to, to have you here joining us. Um, this is going to be a really good discussion. It's one that I am not going to be wearing these the whole time for. Um, Who that the change there with like the red to like bright blues and everything is, is pretty harsh. Um, we're going to be talking about a subject that everyone's talking about for lots of good reasons. Um, AI and how people are actually utilizing it, how we should be talking to um, our teams, to also business leaders about that. Um, I do have a preamble that I want to get into a little bit, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. But before I do that, we should tell um, the audience who we are for, for the members of the audience who don't know who we are. So I'm Jonathan Crow. I'm Director of Community at Ninja. Um, and I've got with me some very special guests. Um, I have names for you as I ought to do, as I tend to do in our holiday theme sessions. Um, let's go around the horn and I'm going to announce you and then I'll give you a chance to kind of give a little bit about color about yourself. Um, okay. So first we have Mindy, let's stay together, Al Green. And, uh, <laughs> Mindy, you are the leader of Rise and Tide Consulting, um, but you're so much more. You're one of the founding members of MSP Geek, um, a community that I know a lot of the folks here in the uh, in the webinar in the audience are members of. Um, we got MSP GeekCon coming up in May. I'm going to be there. I'm very excited. Um, but Mindy, anything else you want to say to uh, introduce yourself? Uh, I mean, you basically covered it. MSP Geek and Rising Tide are who I am. That's basically the beginning and end of my identity. Um, I, I have some MSP experience. I've been at MSP for about 13 years, and which is where I found MSP Geek, uh, the community. So I, I wasn't one of the original starters, but I did start early on. Um, I did join it early on and was made an admin and eventual board member of the NPO. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about the exciting topics that we have coming up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I reached out to you after seeing um, a video. And if you go down to the resources, um, hopefully folks should be able to see there's some links I populated um, in there. And one of them, Mindy, is, is a link to um, uh, your YouTube videos where you've been experimenting with AI for a while. So excited to, to go into some of your experiments. Um, you're doing really cool stuff. Um, yeah. All right, next we have Greg, there is a light that never goes out, Smith. And for those who don't get the reference, that's... Okay, that's on you. Uh, yeah, so I am a, an MSP automation engineer turned Ninja product manager. So I was in the space for about 10 years. Um, I helped um, as a small part grow our company from a pretty small MSP to one of the largest in the world. Now, um, I think that that company is number one or number two um, as far as MSP size goes. Um, but I have since um, jumped to the other side of the fence. I am a huge MSP advocate, uh, and I felt like vendors uh, really needed to have that, that MSP first, um, IT first, um, looking out for those guys um, and not just talking about dollars and cents. So I decided that the best way to fight the good fight was to stop cheering it on from the sidelines and, and put on a jersey and, and actually join a team. So uh, that's what I'm, what I'm doing here at, at Ninja, and um, I'm loving every minute of it. Nice. You're going to make us number one, too. All right. And last but not least, Wes Spencer, roses are red, violets are blues explosion. That was a stretch. <laughs> I'll take it. it. You could have done way worse. <laughs> <laughs> Wes, you, you, you've worn so many hats. You've lived so many lives uh, in the industry. Um, tell the good audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Wes Spencer. It's great to be with you. And I love Ninja and the, the community you y'all have built. Um, so I'm a cybersecurity guy by trade, um, have been most of my career batted around in education and uh, banking for quite some time as a CIO at a bank. Um, I left with a few friends to go create a company called Perch Security way back in 2016. We built that over four years and ended up selling. 
And it was a lot of fun. Um, learned a lot. We pretty much just worked with MSPs, helping them in their security journey. And um, Troy or Tony says he knows Birch. I know, I know you, Tony. Um, uh, but that was a lot of fun. And you know, I learned through that journey just how important and awesome MSPs are. And I know we probably don't have only MSPs on today, but um, you know, the fact of the matter is the SMB sector is not going to be made secure without without MSPs. Period. Um, and so I'm passionate about y'all and helping you out. Also, uh, small businesses. If you're an SMB, you know, leader today, I've been in your shoes. So uh, I love this. I love talking about all things technology and strategy and, and IT and security. So thanks for bringing me on. Absolutely. No, thank you all of you for for taking time um, on St. Valentine's Day, no less. Um, all right. So I'm going to share my screen real quick because I, as I mentioned, um, we've got that bit of a preamble. Um, and it won't hurt my feelings. If you, if you want to skip my ramblings, you can hop back on in like maybe two or three minutes. This isn't going to take too long, um, but hopefully you'll stay. Okay. So uh, quickly, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be uh, covering, I thought it kind of like goes into three buckets. Um, there's the common theme of, AI, theme of AI, but how should um, we as people who are either IT leaders ourselves or work with them uh, be thinking about AI? How should IT leaders be talking with executive leadership about AI? And then finally, last but not least, how should IT leaders be talking with their teams about AI? Because man, let's face it, we're in a weird time right now where we say layoffs um, happening across the board in the tech space at any rate. Um, it's combined with this revolution that we're going through. And I think it's a weird time for employees, employ employers and employees. That relationship's in a weird place right now. Um, we're gonna be giving... <laughs> What a transition. We're going to be giving away some stuff. Um, so for this, um, I was very excited that Mindy agreed to come on this date with us. I'm still going to call it a date, Mindy. Um, I'm okay with that. Because <laughs> Mindy has been sharing um, some experiments. And I think in our discussions, I mean, that seems to be kind of where a lot of people are right now with AI is there's a lot of experimentation happening, which is cool and exciting. Um, we should make sure that we're sharing that knowledge. Um, that's where real magic is going to happen is people sharing things, uh, being open about it and learning from each other. Mindy is a great example of, of someone doing that. Um, but I bet there's some folks here on the call that are doing some things, trying some stuff out too. And we want you to share. So um, here's how we're going to do the prize giveaway. Um, Zoom's poll thing, uh, functionality is a little limited. So instead, we're going to work a little outside the box. The Q&A section, we never use the Q&A section, really. Like, if you have questions, use the chat. We'll absolutely um, do our best to answer them as they're coming in. Um, instead, we're going to go for the Q&A function. Um, we want anyone on the call who has been trying something out with AI, um, tell us what you're doing there. Uh, that will count that as a submission. And then I'm hoping the audience can use upvoting functions in the Q&A for us to pick winners for these prizes. So we're giving away some Beats headphones, um, this cool, uh, uh, this is basically like a Polaroid camera. Andrew in the background is like shaking his head because there's a name for this thing and I don't know it, but it's a cool Polaroid camera. Um, and then uh, some, some awesome delicious chocolates because it's Valentine's Day. So that's how we want to pick the winners. So don't be shy. Um, if you're trying something out with AI, it doesn't have to be something super fancy. Um, anything, uh, go to the Q&A and, and, and put an entry in. Um, okay, so guys, I wanted to start off with um, uh, sharing um, some stats from this Infotech Research Group report. Um, it's called IT Talent Trends in 2024. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. I'll make sure to drop a link in. It is gated and I'm not sharing the whole thing because I don't want to uh, upset them like that. But um, I did pull out some juicy nuggets for you guys. And I would love to get some uh, reactions to this. So um, I thought this was interesting because it really goes at the heart of some of the big questions that um, I think a lot of us are asking ourselves. Um, the first one is this, uh, what, what are overall impact do you expect AI to have on your organization? And um, looking at the numbers here, over half of the people they polled, and to give that some context, this did skew a little bit more towards larger orgs with bigger budgets, um, but the respondents kind of ran the gamut from CIOs all the way down to um, technicians as well. 
So um, of that survey uh, respondent group, they over 57% said they believe AI will have a positive impact on the organization. 18% um, believe it's going to completely transform the organization. Um, only 5% said they believe it's going to bring unwanted challenges and threats. And this is how I know there's not a lot of MSPs in the, the, in the <laughs> respondent group. <laughs> So Mindy, like, because you and I were talking about this and, and I think there's a couple of people who might, you know, take some issue with this. Um, and maybe not so much as like the, the, like doomsday is coming. Um, but maybe just even from the point of view of like, there is new technology out there, just like when SAS came along to departments are going to start using this stuff. Um, it's going to get out of control really quickly. IT people tend to love to have, you know, some parameters control. and guardrails around <laughs> things. And this yeah. seems to, to be uh, uh, something where if anything, yeah, okay, this could make some jobs easier. It seems like it's going to make jobs a lot like more difficult in the short term, but I don't know. Um, am am yeah, I wrong I mean, about that? Like, what are your thoughts? It's technically, a, it's a whole new dimension to shadow IT that we, that people aren't thinking of right now, technically. Right. And that's, I mean, there's a the whole problem with shadow IT is that, IT people like control and like to, because it's not that they like control, some do, but for the most part, if we were to be, to judge them favorably um, or give them the benefit of the doubt, the reason why they like control is because when something goes wrong, they're the ones that have to answer for it, right? So the users come back to them to get it fixed. And so if they don't know what anything about it, then how are they supposed to fix it? They're basically starting off on their back foot from the beginning. Um, well, with AI being so available, uh, there are risks that they can't even see. I mean, even, we saw this in the very beginning. People were just pasting documents to AI to help them understand what it is. And these documents contained sensitive information about client data and whatnot that was sent to ChatGPT and was incorporated into the training data, right? This is a whole big problem that people were, were doing. Um, and so just like something from that, right? Lack of governance, exactly. Um, in, in regards to like what data is being sent to AI, just like right off the bat. Um, but there's another deeper, uh, you know, or more subtle, maybe I should say danger as well that people don't acknowledge right now. And it's that, you know, people have a tendency to believe what they see on the screen. Uh, they feel like when you read it on the internet, it's gotta be true as seen on TV or whatever. <laughs> you want to you know use but there's a bias that people have when they read something that seems factual and the way the ai responds has the confidence level to trigger that bias where people just assume it's correct and so the ai doesn't really know the answers per se most of it is made up in fact probably all of it is made up it just happens to be that what it makes up has enough context to be right most of the time um and so you know, the parts that are not right are not clearly called out. Right. And so that exposes another danger as well to the users. Um, you know, if the user decides from something as simple as I need to fix my computer, the IT guy is slow to respond, let me just ask AI to do it. And then they go do something and end up something doing something really bad or to the point of trying to do something that's not necessarily IT related and end up doing something bad and, and that route. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, subtleties to that danger that's there um beyond just the obvious <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i know that for, even just uh for my own uh use of it whenever i've asked um chat gpt to you know help with breaking down um survey data or, or analyzing data um i catch it i catch errors Making mistakes all the time like almost yeah. every single time i catch errors it's not like, doing oh, like it? math per se yeah. right it's not calculating anything for real uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. And the only reason I catch it is because I've gone that extra step to actually, you know, seek to verify, or because I've spotted yeah. something or whatever. I'm sure there's a exactly. bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do like uh, in the in the chat here. Um, you know, we've got some people uh, uh, saying what they're using ChatGPT uh, GPT for, including scripting and things like that. Um, and then Chris is calling out, we have a lot of vendors proposing AI and, and AI solutions, streamline, streamline workflows, but none of them are actually AI and all are just levels of automation. Um, that's the other thing of it too, that Wes, yeah. um, you know, you brought this up in a recent blog post and um, everybody should 
definitely check out this post. Uh, this went out as part of Empath's newsletter, which you should totally sign up for because I get all these emails all the time and I'm not just blowing smoke here. Like this is one where there was actual substance to it. So thank you, Wes, for taking the time to do that. Um, but you kind of brought up the point that um, there's all the hype. Everyone's eager to say it's an AI solution now, right? But you, you really haven't seen that many, especially in, in the security field, kind of follow through on the promise yet anyway. Yeah, I mean, I look at this a little bit, maybe there's a bit of a hot take, but does anyone remember when like blockchain first came out? Um, well, not first came out because it's been out since like 2009, at least with Bitcoin's iteration, but really like the big hype cycles that came through all of the mid 2010s. And then of course it all blew up when um, a ton of them hit, hit the fan, right? And there's a lot of people that were like, hey, look, you know, this is just a bubble. Um, there's a ton of hype going around it. There's not a lot of effectual change. And so I think a lot of people have said the same thing about what's happening with AI. And I think where they're, what they're getting at is there's a difference between actual like true intelligence versus just largely when we say AI, we're just talking about large language models, or we're talking about some kind of like modeling algorithm that does something like it can study your face. And then of course it, it lets you do some, some, some interpretations to, you know, let voice come in and, and now you get your own AI human um, uh, avatar, so to speak, right? Things like that. I, I I I tend to distinguish and separate the two from like the marketing hype cycle language versus the actual technology. And to me, the big difference just to study what happened to the hype cycles of blockchain versus the hype cycles of AI, AI is actually in the fingertips of the average everyday user, right? We, we actually are using some of the technology that's come out that's blossomed, right? And it is actually effective versus a ton of blockchain stuff is just sort of like this esoteric scam crap that's come out. I'm not saying that all blockchain is, is you know, all scams. I'm not saying that, but I am saying there's, there is a big difference between the utilization of, of what AI is doing versus something like blockchain. I think it's, it's great. It's a fun thing to study those things, Jonathan. I think it's, it's helpful for us to understand, um, you know, the hype cycle versus the reality. And, and Gartner even did an AI hype cycle and kind of studied what's actually being used versus what's being proposed versus what's, you know, complete, um, you know, complete fabrication of, of marketing language, all that kind of stuff. Well, I think, uh, thanks for that, Wes. And I mean, I think what's interesting is um, the role that IT can play in that hype cycle because, um, you know, there's a sense that uh, if you're not playing the game or you're seen as an obstacle to progress, that puts you in not a great spot. Um, and at the same time, too, you know, you've got these other, like we've seen in the chat here, um, people calling out CXOs and stuff. Um, <laughs> And Mindy bringing up the, the point of shadow IT, I mean, you've got departments that are wanting to experiment with this because it's fun to experiment. This stuff is, I mean, it really is capturing some magic here. Um, and it is being transformational in very small ways. Um, maybe not so small ways, but you have people wanting to adopt it. Uh, they're getting eager to it, but there's a lack of governance. There's a lack of the guardrails. Um, IT is in a weird spot where you don't want to be seen as like, they're curmudgeon -y, like you're in the way of this progress. Um, at the same time, you got to get in there. I feel like there's an opportunity for IT leaders to um, uh, give some, really to kind of take charge and give some guidance here uh, to going back to a point that you made, Greg, at the beginning that can help steer it into um, a direction that helps kind of get a grasp of things and reduce risk, but also steers in a direction so it's not just purely a cost-cutting measure. Um, I wanna go to another, uh, actually, Andrew, if you don't mind, um, can you launch, uh, we got a couple of polls for you. Um, also, I wanna call out, man, we've got 72 responses to Q&A, so a lot of people are, are, are messing around with AI, which is cool and terrifying. Um, that's just because I'm old, but, um, Andrew, if you don't mind launching the poll, we want to know from you, the audience, um, are you utilizing AI? So we'll launch that one first. Um, and then the next one that we'll launch is um, mimicking this question that uh, we saw the stats for. Basically, what kind of impact do you expect it to have? But we, we, we uh, uh, put a little context there in the next 12 months. Um, so while, while everyone's filling out those polls, um, let's move on. Um, what are people actually utilizing this for? And Greg, um, I saw in the comment too, the, the one that was saying, you know, AI uh, masking really what's really just automation. I mean, in a way, this is the same conversation 
that a lot of automation in general is is um been playing out too right um yeah absolutely your, your job like you, you know in your world i mean you you were tasked with basically harnessing the power of automation um and doing that in a way that helped your business but also empowered your team and so i'm interested uh when you look at this list um you know is there anything that kind of like did, did that basically is there anything surprising there or does this seem like kind of the same kind of conversation that you guys were having uh, back when you were focused on automation? Yeah, so this is actually, if you're talking about AI and automation, this is where AI starts to get a little scary for the IT world. Um, because uh, when, you, when you talk about AI, right now it's still in its infancy. Um, it has grown a ton, especially over the last couple of years. But um, when we're talking about what Mindy was talking about, the early days of data collection, everybody is just sending so much information at it, and it's just gathering all that information in. And then it can phase into that more description. You know, you throw in some information and you say, you know, what are you looking at here? And it can give you, uh, you know, the, the cliff notes of uh, books of information. Um, and eventually we're going to get it to where it evolves into uh, analysis and prediction and eventually automation. Um, but we're trying to jump right to automation today. And that's where it, it gets a little scary. You see examples of um, people asking about PowerShell code. You know, how do I make this work? Um, and it spits back a result and says, you know, here's the exact parameters that you need to make this happen. And that's great. It solves the need. However, that parameter doesn't exist. That functionality doesn't exist in PowerShell yet. So it just completely made that up. Um, it wasn't real data. Um, or even worse, um, you've got situations where you say, man, this has been, um, I've had some bad patches that keep hitting my machine. You know, there's going through a rough stage with uh, certain third-party applications or even, you know, Windows patches. Um, how can I stop bad patches from happening? And then it spits out, um, you know, just stopping patching altogether for that machine. That's not helpful. Um, and so we have to be really careful in how we utilize AI in our automation process. It definitely is going to upgrade us, um, but I'm, I'm not sold yet that uh, our solution is we give it the problem and it gives up the solution and we can un, um, not vet that and just immediately push that out um, into our production environments. Um, right now, AI has to be used um, as that testing ground that I'm going to throw things at you, you're going to send it back, and I'm going to use that as a good jumping off point to create my own solution. Um, I, I hope eventually we get to a point where that becomes easier and easier, um, but I'm scared of the, the results that, that are being sent uh, today, and I just I, I hope that you guys um, are, are actively vetting that. Um, but yeah, there's there's some great ways that that we can utilize even on the automation side, when it comes to non-detrimental tasks, non-destructive uh, tasks, like communication back to your end users, um, that's a great way when um, an email comes in with a problem and having some sort of um, AI-generated uh, response back to them, um, saying, yep, we have this context-aware response um, to, that's personalized to that end user. That's a great automation we can use today. Uh, but don't solve the actual problem without having human eyes looking at it first. All right. So thank you, Greg. And man, what a perfect segue into Mindy sharing some stuff that he's been working on. Um, before we do that, though, um, uh, let's skip this. We'll come back to that. Um, in terms of use cases, I don't know that this is like, I, I brought this up to Wes earlier, and he was kind of like, eh, maybe. Um, but I, I don't know if this is onto something or not. But um, uh, to some of you, this may be familiar. This is uh, the cyber defense matrix. Um, and uh, it, it's a great way to kind of like get tactical with some of your investments, a way of how you're planning on where you're going to focus and you know where um, there's opportunities for you to improve. Um, and I've completely rewritten that. And I, what I like about it, I've tried to apply this in some other areas too. What I like about it is this thing at the bottom where it's basically showing that you know, there's some tasks where um, they're just made for, it makes sense for technology to really, in automation to play a bigger role. Um, and then there's a spectrum where as you go um, into more complex tasks or tasks that just require more of a human touch for whatever reason, um, I, I kind of like that, that illustration there. And so I wonder if going back to that uh, idea of all of us sharing use cases and kind of thinking about this in a way, if this might be an interesting way to think about some stuff, um, and, and particularly, 
with this columned approach, I feel like where a lot of the initial focus, and this goes to your point, Greg, about er, we're kind of in early days, a lot of the initial focus is on like help desk, for instance. It's like that basic tier one response stuff. Um, and that's where a lot of the initial experimentation is, is kind of focused. And that like it's, it's really almost more like AI as a replacement for something. Um, and I, I'm interested in, in uh, IT's role and maybe thinking about as you go further over to the, the people side, using AI to truly augment uh, people and not just in the ability of like saving time and, and reducing uh, uh, that kind of routine mundane tasks, but helping your people have better insights and things like that. And so I don't know, this is very like, I'm just spitting this out there. I would love to hear thoughts about it. Maybe it's going in a cool direction, maybe not. But um, uh, Wes, before we go into Mindy's examples, um, bring this back to you. Um, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? And then like uh, in, in our discussions before, uh, you bring up the good point about, um, you know, automations for automation's sake in terms of, um, uh, you know, a lot of leadership doesn't really care if IT's job, if, 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 if you're doing your, your job, if it's actually saving you time, um, what's the real business value of that? Yeah, I, I, I did write a post. This is something my, my buddy Kyle Christensen and I were talking about quite a bit lately, and I, I ruffled some feathers with it, and I certainly didn't mean to. Um, but what I was talking about was automation for automation's sake is not necessarily wise or smart. Like, what, what are we actually trying to do? What's the mission of the organization? And how does the tasks that we're doing um, help with something? How does it, what does it accomplish, right? So like an example of this is if I drop onto a decision maker's desk, 500 pages of tickets that I've solved for them, they're like, well, I don't really care. Like, that's just part of your job. I don't need to know about that. I want to know how IT has helped transform our business and what it's doing to help us accomplish our goals. That's what I care about. And the tickets are just back in processes. Same thing with automations, right? Um, just to steal a page from Aaron Chernin, right? One of the things he says, you can't automate a process that doesn't exist. I think that's wise, right? Like, wh what are we actually trying to do when it comes to this? And then I think it's important for us, we owe it to our decision makers when we think about automation to find ways to track this back to profitability, find ways to track this back to how does this actually affect the overall organization as a whole? So if you're like, oh man, I made 400 automations for something that really wasn't a problem or wasn't something I was doing anyway, are you really automating anything, right? Um, have you just added more tasks? Um, in, some, in some cases, you can start automating problems that don't really exist. And then all of a sudden you've actually made life worse because now you're having to maintain and manage it. And we all know from an automation perspective, especially with things like APIs, how often things work today and don't work tomorrow. Now you're troubleshooting and supporting it. And now a lot of your intellectual processing is going into something like that. That's a problem of your own making versus not a problem that existed in the first place. And so I'm a huge fan of automation, but I think we owe it to ourselves to really think higher level of like, what are we actually doing and why are we doing it? And how does it affect the organization? We owe that to our decision makers. And so I think if, if you find that your, your decision makers kind of look at you like the IT nerd, that you're not really important and you're just mumbling stuff to them that they don't listen to and care about, you might want to sort of change the means and language by which you're using to help them understand how you're helping transform their business. Um, and, and maybe you're not, right? Like maybe that's not something we're doing well. So Mindy, I mean, I know that that's heart and soul of like what you're doing. Um, and I know you probably have a lot to say on that too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is really, really important to bring intention to the automation. And, and to your point, you were saying like, maybe, maybe you don't have a lot to say on how you're transforming the business. Maybe that's something you should be looking at. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people assume like, oh, DevOps engineer, automation engineer, like they don't really know how the business runs. They're not really involved in the business processes. Like that's something you should be involved in because that's where you need to be paying attention to. Um, a lot of MSPs or even SMBs will say like, oh, we don't have the budget for an automation guy. Well, you don't have the budget for an automation guy because you don't know what's capable, what's what's available to automate. Um, if you definitely have business processes, and I can guarantee you that a fraction of those business of each of those processes can definitely be automated, if not more. And even offloading twenty or thirty percent of a process is still partial automation that can save you a significant amount of time. Um, so yeah, and and this kind of goes into like the whole AI part. Um, Greg was talking about how. AI is dangerous when you just let it do its thing by itself. Again, there's no question that AI has its dangers, but there are situations within an automation without AI where the automation has to pause waiting for a decision. 
And that decision requires a human. And so the decision of whether or not it needs to move forward doesn't require cogeneration. It just requires something to understand the context of what happened and what the result was. And for that, you can 100% use autom AI to bring that decision-making factor in. So going back to the idea of control and how IT people like control, if we control the level of prompting that we give to AI and we give it strict parameters of what it can or what it should or should not be doing, it's not 100% predictable because it's AI and it's completely random, but it, we do have enough control to say, I need to know, here are two objects. Are they the same object or not? Yes or no. And instead of now having a human look at contacts to determine whether or not they need to be merged, the AI can say, merge, don't merge, merge, don't merge, which you can then push off to fork a script to either do a merge or not do a merge or fork a workflow to doing a merge or not doing a merge. And so that's one of the ways that we can, we can bring AI in, so to speak, um, to do things that is a very tedious task in a business process to manage your contacts and, and, and keep your contacts list organized. Um, but that is a safe way of using AI and incorporating it into your automation. Which, which awesome. is exactly why we shouldn't be fighting um, using AI in our business practices. It's, it's happening, whether we like it or not. And so you can fight it tooth and nail, you can fight the machine, but I promise you it is far more beneficial um, than it is going to be negatively impacting you. And, and just like Mindy said, um, you know, using AI to, to make those um, decision-making processes is so much more important to use alongside automation, not as automation. Um, so yeah, having that separation is great. And, and understanding where that line in the sand is, is going to be very important. All right, so I've teased this long enough. Uh, man, I didn't, I, I have one more tease, I'm sorry. This is just how I do things. Um, okay, let's see the, Andrew, uh, thank you for running the polls. Let's see those poll results. And then Mindy, I would love to see your example. I know other folks would too. Um, so let's check this out. Okay, so we got about um, 50, it's just shy 50% of people who are using AI and I mean, the 82 Q&A submissions definitely uh, suggest that to you. Um, can I just say too quickly, those that said yeah. no, how do you know? Ooh. So you're not saying personally, you're saying like their org. Yeah. 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 Well, good point. I mean, okay. So I dropped a, a, a <laughs> sensationalist article um, up in the chat and you can see from the URL, the title is like, your IT department won't exist by 2030, blah, blah, blah. We've, I've, I think I've seen like this same headline, not related to AI for other things before. It's definitely clickbait, but um, it makes some interesting points. And one of them goes to a lot of the points that you're making too, which is uh, you need to be engaging with business functions, with your decision makers. Um, you know, it may be going back to that business value, how IT is providing, how AI can provide it. You may not know as much how um, marketing could leverage AI as, as well as a marketing leader could. You should be having conversations with that person um, and working with them. Um, otherwise, they're going to go around your back and try to uh, do it on their own. Um, okay, let's go to the next one, Andrew. Um, this was the question about the impact. And I'm interested to see if people... Okay, yeah, look at this. Look at this audience of, of pragmatic realists. They're like, okay, yes. Marginally, marginally positive. Let's not get too crazy. Um, but they're 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 not pessimists. They're optimists. Um, so Mindy, maybe you can change their minds. And then uh, they're uh, they're also pragmatic. Um, look at you folks. All right, cool. Um, Mindy, you've been we've been talking around it in like in kind of broader terms. Let's bring things down to earth and check out some ways that you've been thinking about automation and you're gonna be showing something, but I would also love to know, like, as you started thinking about experimentation, why you decided to start where you did? Like, what was, what was your thought process? Um, so I feel like you may be overblowing it a little bit, uh, <laughs> but I, <laughs> so for me, like uh, right now, I'm a single person uh, business, right? I'm, I'm uh, essentially running everything myself from business operations to the actual consulting that I do to everything. Um, help will be coming, but that's a side point. Uh, 
right now, the amount of time I'm spending on overhead on management of the business is very painful to me. Like every minute I spend is like a sharp jab. Like, hey, you're not billing time. You're not helping your client. You're doing something that's completely not fun, pointless and stupid. And you're only doing it out of necessity, almost like eating, right? Um, so uh, anything that I can automate from my business over, over a management side, I'm looking to do to an insane level. Um, quoting, sending quotes out, emailing a reminder that a quote is still pending, invoice reminders, uh, initial back and forth conversation, just saying like, hey, we need more details um, on what your request is. And so this is like the thing that's always on my mind, everything that I'm going through, every, every time I'm engaged in a process that's not actively working on a client system, um, it's bug, it bugs me and it's like, how can I automate this? How can I offload this? So one of the early, early ones that I did um, was actually, because I use Halo PSA as my ticketing system, uh, they brought in uh, OpenAI and Azure OpenAI integration directly natively into Halo. Uh, so the first thing that I did is cool, let's play with it and see what I can do. And I turned on this thing I call SnarkyBot, even though it's not really its own bot, it's just AI integration with Halo. Um, let me find the window for you and I can show you two examples of how it behaves. And essentially, if you were to send a request into my system, whether this is done over my website or via email or anything like that, if you send a request into my system, you will get an automatic response. I no longer have the new ticket created email that goes out. The new ticket email that goes out is very bland. It's a one static template. I remove that, I don't send that out. And instead I have an automation that fires off an email using AI to generate that email. And so for example, I had my web designer guy, Charlie Sento, who's amazing, sent an email today. I need help doing my homework, can you help me? And the AI is specifically instructed to do it in a snarky tone, asking for more details if necessary, and uh, provide a joke at the end, or using the context of what was in the email if it can. Um, so this is the response that went back out to Charlie. As we can see, uh, it throws a subject in there saying it's not possible. Um, this is completely generated by the AI, wasn't done in the template. And then it sends the message back telling it that uh, use Google to do your homework or find out ways to stop cheating or to not get caught cheating. Um, and that it this is only an MSP AI. And this is done because like in the prompt, I instructed the AI going back to like the controls and the parameters you specify around it. I instructed it on things that I deal with, right? What information it should know, what it shouldn't know, and how to behave. Um, and so then I just included the whole contents of the email and then I send it off and it replies back like that. Uh, and this is what the email, this is what they actually see in the email and from Outlook when it goes back out. Um, and I did include a tag of, this is an automated response generated by Rising Tides Azure OpenAI instance, because the last thing I wanna do uh, is have someone email in and then think that I'm the one responding to this with a snarky attitude to their question, especially like I had a client email in something about how their instance was offline, like, like it was a really bad issue. And AI's like making jokes about it, you know, like this is probably not something funny for them. Uh, but if, so if I replied with a joke, it would be bad. But if the AI replied with a joke, then maybe it's not as bad. So that's why I have that tagline in there. But this actually talks about another hidden danger that you have even for something in Oculus, like having it respond to users, right? If it doesn't understand the severity of what's going on, it can go wild depending on the parameters that you set. And it can, it can be really, really bad. Um, yeah, so this is another example of one I just sent in uh, just now while we were on this session. Uh, I need help with building a roost workflow for automating my lunch order for pizza twice a day every other week. It's supposed to use the context of the email. So I wanted to give it a little bit more context. And you can see it does a joke around the context of pizza and cheese. Um, and so it really does like take the, the contents of the message and builds a almost immersive reply that seems like it's real um, back. And so that's one of the very basic things that I'm doing uh, with the open AI and, and uh, user replies that are going out. You know what I think is interesting about this, aside from like it's hilarious, um, <laughs> is that you you have like made gone to 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 links to call out the fact like 
yeah, we're using AI for this. Um, and it's not trying to fake the things because I mean, that's my thought. And I mean, I think we've all, we've all seen examples and we probably maybe have all experienced these if we've gone, uh, tried to use uh, support bots for various things. Um, it can be very frustrating if you're not getting a good response and you know it's AI. Yeah. Um, as a user and that user experience, I mean, that can be really bad. And so I think it's interesting that like you've, you've called it out um, and I wonder if that's a, like, a, as we start thinking about best practices and stuff, like this idea that, that you're acknowledging it and you're doing it in a way um, where users can know there's an off ramp or something, because it just seems like um, the, the, the pure replacement, which I think a lot of people are jumping to, um, definitely has some risks. Yeah. And actually what I have it doing, like if there is a real request that were to come in, um, like, like it knows, or it assumes, I think, that this is not a real request because of the contents of the message. Yeah. But for real requests that do come in, it does say something along the lines of, you know, please stand by, someone will be with you. Like there's a human consultant. And I call that out in the message. Like it's instructed to specify if we have enough information from the, from the original request to let them know that a human consultant will be with them shortly. Um, and so they don't think that this is the only response they're going to be getting. Right? We don't want them to feel like, you know, you're stuck in the auto attendant hell when you're on the phone trying to get through to a human and you can't get through. Like, I, I want to make right. sure that experience is not uh, uh, assumed or presented in any way. Um, so, yeah, that's included in, in the prompts as well. Um, this is awesome. And um, it's just really interesting to see, like, this is actually used. And, and you've, you've gone into detail with this. And what I love about um, your posting on LinkedIn and YouTube is that, um, you've really kind of posted multiple times about this and shown like the progression of, of an experiment, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do some other things as well. Um, so just in terms of like how this is set up, I have an, the action that's running um, is where the prompt is coming in to play. So let me just show you that real quick. Uh, if we do AI response. So I've got like, like you said, talking about progression, I've got like 1.0 that I, I took away. <laughs> And then I recreated it, and, and so this is the 2.0 version. Um, and down here, we could just say, like, we're telling it to improve a note, to, like, basically build an email note, essentially. And then this is the prompt, where, like, here's the message below, which is this dollar variable. And then reply using a snarky fun attitude. And then, you know, I just, again, providing the parameters, building the context and the controls of how the AI should be behaving and reacting to it. Um, so that, that is basically how I'm doing it uh, in this case. But there's other situations like um, even one that I haven't disclosed yet. So this is something I'm going to be making a video for, but I haven't disclosed yet. Um, but Halo has the ability to build custom runbooks, basically, in, in integration. So it's like a roost light, essentially. And so in here, um, I have... a. Uh, this flowchart that basically runs every time I update my project ticket. And what this does is I'm using Halo SQL to parse out the a list of things that I have to do and parse out a list of things that the customer has to do as a follow-up to the project. And then I'm feeding that item to OpenAI to say, hey, build me a summary of this item so that I can now create additional tasks or additional tickets inside of my Halo for each item that was listed. So when it comes to my, man going back to the point, like I hate the overhead that comes into play, all I'm doing is I'm sending out a recap email of the project of the meeting that I just had. That recap email com contains two lists. One of the list is my to-dos and one list is the client's to-dos. And then this flow runs automatically, parses them out into individual items and send them off to Azure AI to say, hey, build new tickets with these items around the context of these of these details and it just literally builds out brand new tickets for each one um automatically and you can kind of see like the log of how often it's running and it working um and then if we go back far enough we'll actually see a situation where actually i think the logs cleared but it wasn't running all the time <laughs> like there was failures building this out and trying to make it work uh so yeah i mean this is just another another example of how i'm using AI within the system. And again, it's, it's mostly around decision-based factors. I'm not going to say, give me a script and let me go run it. Right? I'm not going to say, like, here's data about the client summarize you know, with sensitive information. It's literally, um, I'm using 
the automation part ahead of time to filter the specific text that I want it to summarize to so making sure that it's literally just a to-do. And then I'm taking that to build out a, a to-do ticket, like basically create new tickets for each one, essentially. Awesome. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. And I wanna make sure that we, we uh, veer over into um, how to talk about AI with your team. Um, and Wes and Greg, this goes back into to, to your worlds. Um, West, especially empath world, um, you know, seeing those examples from Mindy and, and uh, having all the discussion here, I mean, um, you know, there's a lot where uh, some of these early, the early hype around AI and the, the early fears around it, the cycle that we're in, um, it's really causing a lot of reaction of like, okay, AI is something that's going to happen to us all, right? It's coming for us. Um, and I feel like there's a much more knowing our audience are optimists and pragmatic, you know, there is a different approach to it where, um, you know, you can, we can really um, encourage experimentation and embracing of this with your team. Um, but yeah, Wes, I mean, how, how, how are you guys thinking? Cause I mean, you're, you're with empath and this is your chance to talk, say a little bit about empath um, and what you guys are going for. Like, his AI kind of playing into how you guys are thinking about things and, and really help to train and upskill the next level of, of um, IT workers? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not here to pitch impact to anybody. But I appreciate I you not. like mentioning that, right? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, we're definitely doing some things. Let, let me say something that's in my brain first is, you know, when you look at AI as technology, and I love like how, how Mindy is, is showing it in terms of like, here is some technology that I can use to change my life. Well, you can reverse engineer from AI where we're at now in, in workflow automations or whatever it may be. You can reverse engineer this pathway all the way back to like the genesis of the fire being created, right? And if you think about all of these technological innovations that we've had through the course of human history, not only are humans really good at doing this kind of stuff, I also think that what technology does is it transforms something that we thought impossible or something that took a lot of manual tasks and turned it into something that we don't even think about anymore, right? Let me give you a simple example. How many of you thought today when you woke up that, you know, oh man, it's so great electricity is here. It's so great that I can leverage that today, right? Or, or the internet being like, oh, it's so great that, you know, I'm actually, the internet's working and packets are going back and forth and that we can all be talking. We don't have to dial up anymore. <laughs> right. We just, well, you remember those days when we are doing dial up, right? Now it's just embedded here everywhere I go. It's in front of me, right? And so- <laughs> I think what we're moving towards, or, or another example, uh, my friend David Powell was, was talking about like in the early 1900s, there were something like 6,000 elevator operators in, in New York City. And now there's like 10, you know, maybe not even that many. And so what happens with technology is as humans get comfortable, they it all of a sudden sort of transforms into just the assumption that it's always there. And it's always something we're using, right? And so to answer the question, Jonathan, I think where we're going at towards when it when it comes to some of this is how do we embed this wisely into just everyday processes that replace menial or tasks that we had to do on our own that we thought were difficult or, or impossible. And certainly we're, we're doing a lot of that at Empath, right? Like part of what we're doing is helping MSPs understand how to discuss and talk about it, how to help them understand, you know, where the value comes from. But we're also exploring even some cool things in our own, like, you know, what, what happens if we take mountains and mountains of content, dump it into an LLM, and then now we have the ability to, at your fingertips, a modern day Clippy, anything that you want to know from, you know, certain things, it's just, it's right there, right? It's private to you and you're, you're able to consume mountains and mountains of stuff in a way that's much more quicker for you, right? So um, it, it, it's, it, those are things that we're definitely looking at, but I think regardless, just to, again, take a big step back, like this is how we do things and, and no one should feel ashamed when they're like, well, I don't, I don't fully understand how to leverage this. The best thing you can do is be talking with other people and figuring out what are you doing and how are you doing it? That's why that was awesome and eye-opening seeing what Mindy's doing, right? And I'm always chatting with other people on how you're doing different things in your day-to-day -to, -day to take to make changes. Like literally today before this, um, I'll just say this quickly, um, before this webinar started, I have a bunch of long-form training video that we're loading into Empath. And the last thing I want to do is go listen to every piece of it to be able to build summarizations, to build chapters, to build descriptions. So all I do is I dump it into a subtitle or I put the subtitle, give that over to GPT. And I'm like, take all of this and build these elements out of it. And within seconds, I have my answer. It's shaved off hours of work. And so those are things that like, um, I think it's helpful for us to just talk with one another and understand what are you doing and how is it helping you? And what can I learn from it? This is how technology, I think, explodes in its practical use. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. 
Um, Greg, I mean, we've had conversations you and I before, and you've been on webinars before you've talked about this. Going back to your uh, your world where you were leading an automation team and trying to encourage that mindset um, and set people up to be able to have the, the ability to experiment with things and sometimes fail, but also um, just encouraging that, um, the, kind of building the culture of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe that applies here too. Uh, it, it does, yeah. But um, you know, even before that, I, I, I want to mention that I am not a, at all the, the most creative person in the room, not even close. Uh, and some of the most impactful things that I did when I was at my MSP, I didn't create. I, I took that from community members that were the creative ones that were building these, these crazy, amazing processes. Like I have literally taken things from Mindy uh, in the past and I have used that because he has shared that amongst the community. So I would say if, if this is the world that you want to get involved in, just know this it's not a lonely island. We're not all making the, the wheel um, on our island by ourselves. We're not reinventing that. We can lean on each other in the community. And even if you have zero creative skills of your own, if you have the ability to copy and paste with some vetting and verification in, in between there, um, then you're going to still have an incredibly um, impactful um, approach to, to your business. Uh, you're going to be a lot more um, effective in, in everything that you do. And it it just relies on having that conversation, being willing to, to get into the weeds with, with someone else and saying, all right, I'll, I'll spill my, my guts if you spill yours. Well, you know what? Um, there's areas where I'm lacking, there's areas where I excel. And so I, I need to be willing to share where I excel and I need to be willing to um, check my pride at the door and say, yeah, where, where you're excelling, I need to take that and I need to adopt that myself. Um, and as we continue to build um, our community, um, our, our industry is going to grow together. So let's let's not take this, um, this AI venture or the, the greater automation and, and make this um, a race to the top, who can be the best one. Uh, let's make this a joint venture and let's all get together and let's build something amazing together. Um, and so I think that's the most impactful thing that, that we can do um, is listening to these 86 um, Q&A things uh, where people have been using uh, AI in creative ways. Let's look through that. How can you use someone else's genius um, to, to impact your own business? So I think that's the most important. We can listen to Patrick, for example, and we can all sound like Joe Rogan. Um, no, but the, Greg, well, well said. And um, I think this is making clear, like we got to follow up. I mean, there's there's another type of format. I'm not sure what that is, but I would love to work with everyone, the speakers here, but also uh, folks on the call too. Like, I, I feel like there's something we could put together um, that's sharing some of these things in a way where, um, uh, yeah, people can get ideas and, and kind of share results and things like that. Um, okay. Okay, so we got about uh, five minutes left. Um, Andrew is, so, so I can't remember who it was. Sorry, apologies, but someone in the chat brought up the point. We have 85 submissions. No one's gonna like upvote another person's. Um, I think we're gonna have to redo this a little bit. So Andrew is picking five examples and he's gonna launch a poll. Um, and then we can pick our winners, contest winners from that. Um, but I do wanna revisit these at some point. Thank you again for, for everyone who took the time to, to respond to that. Um, Okay. I've been scrolling so, through. People have been upvoting, by the way. Like there oh, are some that have like four or five upvotes. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, I'm just saying <laughs> you have to pay attention to that. <laughs> oh, it's because they're not sorted. Yeah, they're not oh, sorted. Boom. They're sorted by submission, right? But like Daniel has an upload of four people using it to put together SOPs from tasks that are done regularly and revise existing SOPs and documentation. Also for summarizing meeting notes to publish via Teams. Uh, so, uh, don't listen to Jonathan. An Andrew's doing this right. Don't worry. He's got a <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one that had six. You. I can't. I can't find it again. But there was one that had six upvotes. I see uh, one that has five. Um, I need to sort on most upvotes, and that seemed to find find process. it. You sort it. Oh, you can sort it there. Look at that. Yeah, I just noticed that too. Look at that, Wes. Teaching us how to use technology. Most recent, most <laughs> Oh my God. Thank you, Wes. See, it takes a village and um, at least for me. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. Well, we've got, okay. The one person's creativity uh, impacts and helps everyone on the call here. So there you I go. like uh, John <laughs> is better <laughs> off because of Wes's. Maybe Wes's uh, common <laughs> sense helps me. Thank you guys. Um, Just clicked around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like we okay. All so I will call attention to this. Okay. We got four minute countdown. 
get your votes in. Um, we have Daniel Testing at the top with six upvotes, John Byrne with five, um, unless I'm not seeing these correctly, but we need three winners. So uh, take the time to, to help vote. Um, okay, let's bring this thing home. So um, I've got a couple, uh, one last slide that has some suggested next steps from that um, report that I was sharing earlier. We can kind of comment on that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I always like to bring it home to kind of like a, a, a practical um, thing at the end here. Um, so we can certainly do that. I also want to give you, Greg, a, a second to talk about um, going back to the idea of users and having them involved in this kind of thing. Um, yeah, Mindy, you, so. you, you latched on to this point too. There's like automation that basically removes uh, our needing to deal with users. <laughs> Another way that IT has been experimenting for a long time is self-service, right? Yeah. Um, and so, Greg, I'm kind of, uh, I, I know you've been working on this. This is an area that you focus on Ninja, so I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, when it comes to um, getting things off of your plate and, and freeing you up, you know, elevating the human and automating the mundane, um, there's different levels of that. And so obviously the, the number one level is to have an automation that um, tackles the root issue, wipes it away, and it's never a problem again. Uh, the second iteration of that is if, if you can't really eliminate the, the root problem um, to at least squash the symptoms as soon as they arrive. And so uh, just because the problem is there, you'll, you'll never have to deal with the, uh, the effects of that problem because you have automation that takes care of that for you. Uh, the, the third iteration of that um, is, is something um, I, I got... Uh, a little bit of heat last time because I, I called this um, abusing your end users, but but really it's just utilizing your your end users and your own customers. Um, if if you um, have these um, you know mundane type tasks that one person is having to to do this for every single company that you have or every single department that you work with, um, that is a very mundane task. Whereas if somebody puts in a ticket that they're onboarding a new user, for instance, um, it is very easy for that customer to say, here's the name of the person, here's the email that they are going to use, here's the type of um, employee that they're going to be, and that let them type in that information for you and then have automation on the back end to take care of that. So even in those areas where it is that unstructured data that you can't have an automation for, um, I don't know who the next employee is going to be for X customer or X department. Um, allow your end users to have the freedom to put in that information for you and then have your automation on the back half of that. Um, and even with the current employees, um, like installing applications, you can have a list ready to go of approved applications that for their line of business or for uh, different areas that, that they are going to be focused on, put that power back in their hands. Um, if you know that they're going to need Adobe Reader or there's a chance that they, they're going to need it, let them say, yeah, install that on my computer. Uh, let them run a script to, to fix their issue. Let them reset their own passwords. Um, th that is the, the next evolution of, of freeing that up. And that's exactly what we're doing uh, at, at Ninja here. We're, we're, we're redefining the end user experience. So we're taking our end user portal, we're revamping that to add a lot more of that automation and that functionality and that flexibility um, so that your team can remain light, you, you can remain lean, you're freed up to do those more higher level, elevated human um, style um, processes in your company and automating that mundane um, and just making your life much easier. Um, because if you've got less tickets, uh, you've got um, a smaller team, a leaner team, and your, all your team members can be working on things that actually matter, not just busy work um, that automation could do on your behalf. So that's what we're working on at Ninja. We've got an app coming out. We've got the end user web portal that's getting uh, revamped. Um, and there's a lot of exciting things around that. So we'll, we'll unveil that more um, in a bit. I did but, hear that um, it's going to have dark mode. It is going to have dark <laughs> mode, the app and the web portal. Uh, so uh, that's what everybody seems to, to, to care about the most is uh, SSO and um, dark mode. So it's just going to be a blank page, nothing on it. It's just going to have dark mode and SSO and everyone's going to be happy according to the upvotes that I'm getting. <laughs> awesome. Um, guys, thank you so much. If you have to run, um, I totally get it. We're at two. Um, if you have a chance, if you do have time to stick around for like a one last parting thought, um, maybe this is one way to do it is, is uh, these are the suggested next steps that, that um, the, uh, the Infotech uh, 
research group provided. Um, tiered with beginner, intermediate, advanced. Um, you can either disregard these or if there's something you want to chime into, that's, that's cool too. Um, if you have your own advice, that's even better. Um, Mindy, let's start with you. What's, what's a parting thought for people who want to take an actionable next step? Um, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't have one because it, I mean, just looking at what people are submitting on the suggestions, they're already yeah. basically doing it right. Yeah. Uh, just make sure you're doing it safely um, is really the, the key. Uh, everything that we had talked about of the dangers is it, like from the most important one is don't ask it for a script and assume it's going to work right off the box. You need to, you need to vet it. Um, and then don't give it information that it shouldn't have. Just like you wouldn't give sensitive information out beyond the organization. I feel like um, there's a lot of overblown, um, there's there's a lot of uh, over dramatically uh, created um, messaging around what that governance policy needs to be. I mean, essentially the AI is outside your organization. And so whatever policy you already have for sharing the data outside your organization, it should be, or it should already be falling into that. Um, you know, and then essentially pulling code from outside from AI is like going to an online form and grabbing the script. And you should already have policies in place to vet that before you run it. And so, you know, I, going back to the idea of like, I'm not a fan of too much overhead and, and, and stuff like that. Like there's already work in place that should be protecting you as long as you apply it in the right way. So you just may, it just needs to be a shift in mindset to realize like AI is not part of your organization. Um, it's an outside tool. And so therefore just take the same precautions. But for the most part, like the people provided um, ways they're already using it as a starting point, that's a fantastic way of doing it, right? A lot of people are very good at fixing things or adding to it. They're not really good at starting from scratch. AI can get you there, can start you from scratch and then you can go from there. Um, you know, and that's basically, that's basically all I have in regards to the next steps that, that, you know. I think that's a very excellent point that you made. Um, Wes, over to you. Yeah, you know, I'll just say um, share, share alike, learn, learn alike. You know, this is, we're fortunate because this iteration of technology um, is in our fingertips and in front of us. Um, I, I find just these discussions talking to others is one of the most valuable things you can do. And one of my favorite um, newsletters is called The Rundown AI. Um, really, really like it. It's by Rowan Chung. And um, I find myself constantly reading and loving it because he's just talking about all the things that are happening, news, showing new things that are being released. And, and I just, I'm a big fan of it, right? Um, so so I just think for me, just soak up knowledge and learn and don't, don't. we all have to understand we're all learning use cases and where this is, where, where we can use this. And fact from FUD, what's actually effective versus what's just marketing. Um, and so I, I think that's what I would share is just go make sure you have a learning strategy behind the scenes on, on what you're doing. Awesome. Um, Greg, bring us home. Yeah. So um, since, since Wes stole my point here, um, I'm going to expand that a bit um, and say um, to, to an earlier point that he made, on um, trying to differentiate what AI can do for you or automation can do for you versus what it should be doing for you and, and how we should be um, implementing it. Um, I would say a, a good rule of thumb is to uh, just go be a fly on the wall for your company. Go sit down with your help desk. Um, they're gonna tell you some pains, but there's gonna be some pains that they have that they're just so used to. Um, they're so, um, uh, used to those problems that they're, they're not even going to understand or know that they're problems just because they're desensitized to it. So just sit down and spend time with your help desk, spend time with your sales department, spend time with your office administrator, uh, just go to these different areas and see what are the pain points um, that they are dealing with, that they know about, what are some pain points that they're even blind to, and then try to think, how can I use um, automation to help make their lives easier? How can I take those those 12 hour mundane tasks and turn them into 12 second automations like Mindy has been able to do um, in, in his processes? Um, it's all out there, it all exists. So um, while we should be leaning on our community and, and seeing all the awesome things that they're doing, not everything that uh, your peer is building for their company is going to make sense for you and your company. Um, so, so just be very mindful of what you need and what your company needs and then go into the community and, and see how other people are solving those problems. So spend time with your users or AI will is the exactly. Valentine's Day advice, I think. Um, 
Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone. So let's announce the winners real quick. Um, and thank you, Wes and Mindy, again, for correcting me and informing me. Um, all right, the big winner, Daniel Testing. Congratulations, you won some Beat headphones because uh, you've been utilizing AI to uh, put together SOPs from tasks that are done regularly and revising those existing SOPs and documentation, summarizing meeting notes. Awesome, good job. My favorite one is Isaac Kearns. Um, you are our second prize winner. You're gonna have um, that sweet Polaroid uh, camera. You've been using ChatGPT to generate on the fly adventure hooks for your D&D &D player group when they decide to ignore your sewer hooks and wander away. I can empathize, my friend. Um, and yes, for people asking, this is backups and bandwidth. Uh, we did this last year for World Backup Day. I think we're going to do it again. Um, we're going to do some table topping around uh, disaster and recovery. It's going to be fun. And then last, uh, third place, uh, John Byrne. Um, oh, yes, Wes, with your figurine. Um, AI can be, uh, wait, can we, <laughs> well, you got upvoted for the problems thing. But you also uh, have creating a helper for Q&A for new U.S. arrivals prior to communicating with our dedicated uh, relocation team. That's really cool. Um, so thank you everybody for taking time. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Um, Wes, Mindy, Greg, you're awesome. Um, I'll leave you with this dumb little joke that I had that I didn't get to share before. Um, <laughs> I already said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear you say it again. Okay. Thank you All guys. Right. Thank you everyone uh, in the audience. This has been fun. Thank you. And we'll see you for the next one.